Hello, my name is Dr. Gerard Toll, and this is the second lecture on the book Network Propaganda. And here I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the uh, concept of media architecture, landscape and ecosystem. Um, now, um, we can think about uh, the media within the um, terms of uh, what sociologists and those that study power structures have um, categorized as uh, networks of power. I'm thinking in particular of the work of Michael Mann, a sociologist who identifies four different networks of power. Uh, networks that he associated, associates with the economic power, with corporate entities, with businesses, uh, with then the state or the military in particular, historically was extremely important in helping create and was at the center of the state, at the state. Then uh, political parties, those that are uh, governing um, and that uh, assert uh, and organize and uh, mobilize people. Um, and assert uh, control at the local and uh, at the national level. And lastly, he focuses in on ideological or religious networks um, that help provide a, a sense of identity uh, and a sense of meaning to uh, different uh, populations. Now, of course, what is important here is how they interact. So economic networks are associated with political parties and often sponsor political parties, and those political parties in turn often uh, shape ideological and religious uh, institutions. Now, the media here can be uh, seen as part of a kind of connection, at least in a democratic state, between economic uh, interests. It's a so-called free press, but it's actually owned by, by businesses uh, in the United States as opposed to being non-profit uh, and uh, govern, uh, governed by non-profit rules as it is in other particular states. Uh, where you have uh, different structures. And one of the points of the book is that the particular epistemic crisis that the United States finds itself in is uh, in one sense more acute than in other countries because of the fact that the United States has particular uh, networks of power which are different in, in different countries. And, uh, uh, and so therefore the ways in which media is controlled uh, is more um, uh, related to corporate ownership uh, and uh, related to political parties uh, because there's often a movement between political parties and media organizations in the United States uh, in contrast to other countries where uh, professional media uh, is uh, to the fore and is always a uh, front and center and uh, media organizations are uh, don't necessarily have political agendas in the same way as they do in the US. And of course, in, in certain uh, more authoritarian states, uh, you have even more extreme cases of this. Now, uh, sociologists uh, such as uh, William Domhoff uh, in his uh, books, Who Rules America? And I say books because it's the one book, but uh, there's at least seven editions of it. Um, and he builds upon the work of C. Wright Mills, uh, who identified a power elite uh, at the center of the structures of power within the United States. And uh, Domhoff uh, sort of gives us um, the policy planning network of hired uh, experts and how they relate to corporate communities. So how this congeals in the United States is, is particular. Um, there are also uh, books that then really focus in on how the media is part of this larger uh, structure. Um, now, the media is a term which is shorthand uh, and is um, a, often um, not sufficiently um, descriptive of the heterogene heterogeneous nature of uh, media within the United States because there is a really heterogeneous landscape out there. Um, but uh, various critics and uh, political theorists such as Sheldon Wallen in his book Democracy Incorporated argues that um, because the United States is an oligarchic capitalist system uh, where corporate businesses are really at the center of life and exercise tremendous control as a consequence has uh, extremes of uh, income uh, inequality that that uh, shapes the media and shapes what is possible to uh, discuss uh, within the media. 
um, Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky are famously have written about this in their book Manufacturing Consent. There's also a movie which is that that is based upon, and that particular phrase is taken from uh, Walter Lippmann, uh, and then others say uh, such as Jacques uh, Ellul, the French. Uh, a scholar uh, has written about a uh, propaganda. So there's a large uh, literature that um, uh, addresses the question of um, the media architecture and its relationship to structures of power. Now, how does that relate to this particular book? Well, what they're interested in is looking at the uh, development of the what they call the architecture of our discontent. And they, in chapter 11, and it's in one sense, it would be worth reading that at the beginning. Uh, they have an unusual way of uh, organizing the book. I mean, it does begin with the kind of contemporary epistemic crisis, uh, but it comes from somewhere. It's not something that is sui generis. It's not something that Trump created. Uh, it's not um, all about Trump. It's very much about the structures of power and the ways in which... Um, media fits into those structures of power within the United States. And so in chapter 11, they give you a history of this architecture. Now, the term architecture really refers to the network structure of ownership uh, and where the power is, where the sort of pillars of power are, what's at the center, what's at the fringes. Uh, the phrase landscape, the media landscape, really uh, refers more to the spread and balance between different types of media, such as television, such as radio, such as social media and search, uh, uh, such as then uh, the uh, conspiratorial web like the 4chans and uh, other um, uh, platforms. So that's uh, uh, the media, the term uh, landscape. Then the term ecology refers to, uh, media ecology refers to the communication environment. And this is a notion which comes out of the work of Marshall McLuhan and Neil Postner as the person who coined the term media ecology. And it really is centered on the, around the person experiencing, navigating and surviving in a world where they're um, bombarded by messages, uh, by media and uh, conditioned by it. Um, and so the media ecology is about the ways in which uh, it, it creates a certain enveloping uh, environment uh, for um, the uh, people who are caught within it. So what does this mean uh, in relationship to the book? Well, they talk at the beginning about uh, how you have centralized versus decentralized media. You have commercial versus very political media. And you can begin to analyze some of the uh, particular, uh, they're, they're using the term threat models. In other words, some of the particular groups that were pointed to as be, uh, representing our uh, epistemic a crisis as representing threats to the possibility for a, a democratic a discourse and deliberation a, for a unitary polity to discuss issues in ways which show fidelity to the truth, to a, empirical realities, to science a, and to um, uh, to marginalize the superstition and to marginalize con conspiracy, uh, conspiratorial thinking. Um, they also provide you uh, with a, a different version of this in terms of the technological versus the institutional. And so in discussing that, you will get some sense of the uh, particular uh, ecology that we find ourselves in today. Important point is to think about it within these larger structures. That's what they're interested in. Uh, that's the kind of concern, and that's what make makes what they're studying here generalizable to other particular places. So you emphasize not technology itself, not the internet. Uh, you emphasize the structures of power and how a uh, communications environment, uh, the media ecology, uh, is embedded within that, entangled within it, 
within state structures, uh, but also then buffeted by international and transnational uh, trends and uh, ownership patterns. Okay, so uh, that's our second end of our second lecture on network propaganda. Thank you.